Okay, so what I want to talk about in this lecture is kind of the numerical aspect of probability. So since we're talking about rolling dice and flipping uh, coins, we can basically do thousands of these experiments numerically and then start to look at whether the results of the experiments kind of match up with our probability intuition. Okay, and so most of my uh, experiments in these lectures are going to be in MATLAB, but you can do this in Python or C or whatever you want. So first thing I'm going to do is just kind of set up the assumptions, right? So it's kind of like numerical... Today I'm just going to flip coins, so numerical coin flipping. And the setup is the binomial distribution that we've been talking about so far, right? So I'm just going to plot the results of the binomial um, kind of experiments where n is the number of times I flip the coin, p is the probability of success, and k is the number of uh, trials I'm going to do, meaning I have a handful of 10 coins, I throw them on the table, I count the number of heads, and I do that k times, and I see what the results look like. Okay, So I wrote a little function in MATLAB to um, simulate this. Very easy to do. I didn't uh, bother to show you the code, but this is like saying flip 10 coins 10 times, and they're all fair coins. So what do we get? We got, one tri we got uh, four trials where I got three heads, and two trials where I got two heads, and two trials where I got five, and two and I got six. So it's hard to look at this data and conclude anything about, for example, what is the underlying uh, probability of getting a head, right? So if I flip 10 more times, I get a whole different set of results. So there's not much I can conclude from just doing a few experiments, right? So the first thing to observe is, well, if I did this over, say, 100 experiments instead, what happens? Well, I mean, there's still a lot of variability, but things look a little bit more consistent in the sense that, for example, things are roughly symmetric around getting five heads, which is kind of what I expect to happen. Um, if I flip the coins a thousand times, then things become more consistent. And if I say a hundred thousand times, for example, well, now there's not that much change that I can see in this collection of results. So couple things to take away from this, and we're going to develop these ideas much further as we go into the lessons. So one is that the more trials I do, the more consistent things become. The second thing, which is kind of interesting, is that the distribution, the shape that I get after I keep on doing these experiments, is kind of converging to this kind of familiar bell-shaped curve that we know from statistics and from kind of pop science. And there's a reason for that. Why do things seem to be converging to this shape? We're going to talk about that in some detail too. Okay. So before I leave this, I also want to say, okay, what happens if instead of a fair coin, where the probability of getting heads is one half, I have an unfair coin, where say the probability of getting heads is uh, 0.8, okay? So I'm much more likely to get a head. Now, this shape kind of skews over to the right, because I'm going to get uh, more heads more of the time, right? So it's unusual that I have a sequence of flips where I get zero heads, right? So again, the shape is consistent but now it's kind of skewed over to the right. And if I were to kind of do the opposite and say, okay, actually the probability of head is very low, now it kind of skews over to the left and I have a whole different kind of shape. I'm not sure why the axes didn't scale the same way, but you get the idea. And if I return to a fair coin, I get back to my kind of symmetric around the middle distribution. So one thing that we can kind of uh, talk about next is, okay, suppose that I flip the coin all these times and now I want to figure out um, you know, how to estimate P, right? So suppose that I gave you a coin and I don't tell you whether it's fair or not, and I ask you, what would you have to do to test whether this coin is fair or not? Well, a natural thing to do would be to uh, keep flipping the coin over and over again, and I could count the number of heads, um, and I could say something like, you know, my estimate of p is the number of heads I observed over the total number of flips. Okay. So one question is, so if, let, let me just call this, say I had k successes over n flips. Okay. So one natural question is, you know, how big does n have to be to get a good estimate of p? And so there are some bounds on this, and one famous one is called Bernoulli's theorem.
this says the probability of my estimate heads over number of flips minus the true probability being off by more than a certain amount is bounded by this number. Now this is a lot of math and there's some stuff here I haven't really fully defined yet. This is kind of a preview to some of the stuff that we're going to talk about a lot later in the class relating to things like laws of large numbers. But the main intuition here is just like saying the probability that my estimate is further from the truth than some number epsilon, right? And the key thing to note is that you know, as n gets larger, then this number gets smaller, right? So this is kind of like saying that, you know, as my, um, you know, number of trials gets bigger, the probability that I'm further from the truth by any given amount gets smaller and smaller. And that kind of, kind of corresponds to the intuition that we saw with everything kind of converging to the same shape of graph, saying that the more I do, the more consistent my results will be, right? Um, and so numerically, we can plug some numbers in, right? So we can say, for example, Let's suppose that I do um, 10,000 flips. So let's say I do 10,000 flips of a fair coin, so P equals a half. So what do I expect? I expect to get, on the average, 5,000 of those flips being heads and 5,000 being tails. Now we know from these Matlab experiments, and I'm going to do some more in a minute, that um, you know we probably are not going to get exactly 5,000. We may get 4,500 or 4,850 or something like that, right? But this Bernoulli's theorem, if I plug in all the numbers I have, tells me that the probability, for example, of the number of heads being between 4,900 and 5,100 is greater than 0.75, right? So this is like saying that the probability that the number of heads and hence that my estimate, you know, so my p hat is going to be in the range 0.49 to 0.51. So I'm really nailing down the estimate of p within this narrow interval, um, you know, with pretty high probability, right? Or a different way of saying this is, suppose that I did um, a million flips, oops, and again, p equals one half. Then, if I wanted to put a similar bound, it would turn out that it would be this. Oops. 501000. So again, I expect to get 500,000 heads, and here my bound P is going to put it between 0 0.499 and 0 0.501 with a probability of 75%. So I can be pretty sure that if I do a million flips, I'm going to get to within 0 0.001 of the probability three quarters of the time, right? So it's a little bit, you know, confusing. There's lots of terminology here. We're going to talk about this more in future lectures. It's almost like a little uh, wetting your appetite for future probability. But a key idea in general is in the limit, the more flips I do as n goes to infinity, the probability that my estimate minus the truth is off by any number I choose, this is zero, right? I can see that because of this formula here. This says that as n gets bigger and bigger, as n goes to infinity, the right-hand side becomes zero. So that's great news. That says that our estimate is going to get better and better the more flips that we do. Um, and I can get as close as I want. This is an example of what's called the law of large numbers, and we're going to do some more experiments like that. So let me just show you, coming back to MATLAB, um, you know, I wrote another function called flips, and this is just saying what happens if I do, uh, you know, 100 flips of a coin and the coin is fair, okay? Well, in this trial, I got 46 out of 100, so my estimate of P would be 0 0.046. I'm sorry, 0 0.46. Um, and if I do it again, I get a different number of heads. This time I got 52, and this time I got 56, and this time I got 60, which was actually a, quite a lot. So my estimate of P is kind of bouncing around here, and what we just learned was if I make the number of flips higher, then my estimate of P should kind of settle down, right? So let's suppose I do uh, 1,000 flips, all right? Now, my estimate of P is kind of, you know, a lot closer to 0.5 than it was before. It's still bouncing around a little bit. Um, and if I were to do, say, 100,000 flips, 
well now, you know, I'm really not very far from 0.5 at all, right? So things are looking better and better. Um, so again, this is an example that we're going to develop a little bit more as we talk more and more about what happens in the limit as we do lots of experiments. The last thing I want to say is that um, I also have noticed the, the longest string of heads, right? So let me go back to just doing 10 flips. So actually, this is a crazy, um, well, that's not that crazy. This is probably an example where I got a pattern like uh, head, head, tail, head, tail, head, something where I was alternating heads and tails, right? Um, here's an example where, again, I got five heads out of 10, but I got a substring head, 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 right? And so kind of what I want to talk about is what's called like this um, kind of gambler's fallacy, right? So there's definitely um, a situation where uh, if you're in the casino and you're playing craps or whatever, that if I, you know, hit on my lucky number, it's bound to come up sometime or something based on the fact that, you know, based on past behavior of rolling the dice, the future will be better, right? So um, we can have long runs of, you know, heads, dot, 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 um, while still having a fair, fair coin. So one way of thinking about this is because we talked about the idea of independent events, right? The probability of getting head, 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 tail is the same as getting the probability head, 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 and then head. The reason for this is that all these events, all these coin flips are independent, right? So knowing all the stuff that happened before doesn't change what my next flip is going to be, right? The coin doesn't have a memory. And we're going to talk about this memoryless process uh, in a couple lectures from now, right? Um, so just keeping in mind, I want to go back to my simulation that say I do um, 100 flips and I could get some, you know, let's see how, how much I can get. I got seven heads in a row one time. Let me do like a thousand flips instead nine heads in a row. So you might think, oh, here's one, 14 heads in a row, right? So you might think, man, I flipped the coin, I got 14 heads in a row, this coin is messed up. But the idea is that probabilistically, these things happen while still having a totally unbiased coin, right? So this is kind of why people are, uh, you know, constantly losing money in Las Vegas is because they think, oh, you know, it's got to come up next time, you know, it's got to come up next time. But there's no law that says that you're owed, um, you know, to get a head on the next flip. All that you're owed by probability is that in the very, very long run, the average number of heads over all those flips is going to correspond to the true underlying probability of getting ahead. So, okay, like I said, we'll return to this kind of idea uh, in the future, but this is just kind of a preview.